chapter six of our analytics data science and artificial intelligence course so we're going to take a look at kind of a Deutsche Bank and what they do so that's your opening vignette that is our case study for the week and one of the things that is really interesting with how they went ahead and did all of their neural networking and artificial intelligence and machine learning was that they were able to realize a 60 percent reduction in false positives you know, with an expectation to reach as high as 80% and then increase true positives by 50%. So by focusing on resources for actual cases of fraud, they're actually able to work out exactly how fraud was happening in terms of how the bank worked, right? And again, if you can reduce your false positives, that's great. And then increase your true positives by 50%. That means you're gonna catch more fraud that's going on. And it can happen at any point within your cross-functional team for mentoring initial waves, um, leveraging APIs and training to kind of make sure that you're validating your data and that you're validating your processes along the way. So really kind of neat what Deutsche Bank did and how they were able to reduce their fraud examples. Now, we're gonna take a look at what's called deep learning. Now, deep learning with AI-based learning is a really interesting process when it comes to how we wanna do things. So it can also be known as deep structured learning and as part of a broader family of machine learning methods based on artificial neural networks, ANN, right? With representation learning. Learning can be supervised, semi-supervised, or unsupervised. So when you go through how you work on your process, again, you're still working with data, but what you're doing is you're working with the data either supervised, unsupervised. So you can use deep learning architects such as deeper neural networks, which we'll cover here in a little bit, deep elite networks, reinforcement, reoccurring, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of different ways of doing this in terms of how you are going to do an architecture for the learning. And these have been applied to fields all over the place. So again, you're gonna be using this for speech recognition. You actually may get captions based on this, um, computer vision so that your Roomba works better, natural language processing, machine translation, language translation. Part of the way Google Translate works is to be using a deep learning model so you can translate between Mandarin and English and English to Mandarin again. So they can, they can produce results comparable and in some cases surpass human expert level performance. So these are really kind of neat. So that adjective of deep and deep learning refers to the use of multiple layers in the network. So the more layers you've got, the way it will work better. So you can actually have and see that whole process here in representation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. You can also use any kind of knowledge-based system, classic machine learning, and then deep generic, and then deep learning to go along with it. And these layers will really help out, kind of tidy up the model and make things a little bit easier for you. Now in the figure, right, you can kind of see in the AND model here, they say compute the output, is it, the desired output then no adjust the weights you can go back and adjust things as they go and you can do this either through supervised learning or through unsupervised learning um, along the way so as you kind of go through things on learning um, it will work better for you so supervised machine learning is that the difference between the two of them is basically the labeled data the main distinction between the two approaches is the use of labeled data sets so supervised learning i'm going to use a data set that is labeled with input and output data while unsupervised learning does not. So as long as I've got some labels on my data sets, we'll be in pretty good shape. And then as part of the performance function of that is to make sure that I'm actually getting what I want. So once I get to where I want, I can stop and freeze the weights. So I'm going to run multiple iterations on this to make sure that I'm getting what I need to have. Now that can be something I know to be a fact, right? Or a check mark or benchmark or something I know will work better, something I know in that reality. So my model will actually then give me that desired output to meet that fact. And then I can do my prediction modeling based on that. What makes this even more interesting is when you kind of get into that idea of overfitting and underfitting. So overfitting is good performance on the training data, but poor generalization to other data. In other words, I may get exactly what I want on the training data, but my prediction modeling is horrible. And then I can also underfit my data and I will get poor performance on the trading data and poor generalization on the other data. So you really want to try to get good fit all the way and not overfit or underfit your data. You want your, your training data to be good performance and your generalization to other data to be good. And that's why you're going to move those weights around, adjust the weights to make sure you get to at least a couple of two or three data points that actually make sense and are actually realistic for the data that you are working with. So 
eliminating the black box of an artificial neural network. So what's interesting for a lot of the stuff is when you get into um, what's called a systematically perturbed output. So that is a process where you're actually taking a small change in a component and moving it around. So typically in this theory, uh, a small change in a system which can have a result of a third object interacting with the system. And kind of think about it maybe like a butterfly effect maybe Right, where I'm going to have a butterfly take flight and that will impact air, that will impact molecular movement, that will do a thing, and all the way through that small change. Interacting with all the other variables in here can change that output. And you can actually either do this as a real world, right? Chemistry. Chemistry is great for this. Um, chemistry is really awesome because you make that small change in how that atom works or how that chemical bond works, you can see the observed change in outputs. Again, my cousin who does peptide research um, is part of that process. He's doing little changes, little tweaks to see what ends up happening with that peptide. And he's getting that whole systematically perturbed input, which then turns around and gives him an observed change in outputs, which may or may not then turn around and lead to something useful for research later on down the road. Now, deep neural networks is a lot of math. So really that input, you're just running it through various layers to get to the answer that you want to get to or get to the answer that makes sense. Then convolution of neural networks is another process that goes along with it in terms of the convolutional limit. You have an input, you go ahead and do a convolutional unit, and then you get your ad output on that, and you're going to do it through systematic pooling. Then recurrent networks, long and short-term memory networks. And these are specifically designed process sequential inputs. And you'll sometimes get those, so especially a log file or something like that. Um, it's just timestamp, what happened? Timestamp, what happened? So an RNN basically models a dynamic system where at least one of the hidden neurons at a state in the system at each point in time depends on both the inputs to the system at that time and its state at the previous point in time. So it's basically time dependent. It's basically a lockstep kind of sequential input. And again, great for log files, great for batch, if you want to process batch data, but great for anything that has a timestamp to it or a sequential order to it. So not really good for peptide research, but really good for security information management. So you would want to use this for a security information management system or something else like that. Um, computer frameworks for implementation of deep learning, you're going to learn about Torch, Cafe, TensorFlow, and Theano. I am more familiar with TensorFlow. Um, that's the Google product. It is both algorithm and hardware. So TensorFlow is a really interesting deep learning network. Um, you have to have really good data for that to make it work well. But it's definitely worth looking into, and we can talk about TensorFlow at any time if you want to for how that works and the process around it. Then cognitive computing. Now, I really like cognitive computing because of the way it ties a bunch of technologies together, right? So it's taking together machine learning, natural language processing, neural networks, deep learning, text mining, sentiment analysis. So again, go back to my Yelp reviews for my hotel. And it really does offer some really interesting capabilities, especially when it comes to trying to simulate or make a simulation of human thought processes that basically assist humans in finding solutions. Um, it's really kind of interesting, especially when we're dealing with things that may be outside of my expertise. So if there are some hacking methods I'm not aware of, and if I have a really good cognitive computing model to work from, I can actually learn more about my opponent than, than anything else. So it's really used to augment my own ability to work with security information management systems and security information management and cloud computing. So I really like it a lot. Um, there's some things that I have done for other companies that actually built out some really interesting modeling for security information management systems along the way as a way to um, basically enhance service for the security team that I was working with at the time. Now, the industries that can really use cognitive computing to their benefit, again, information security, customer service, right, marketing, healthcare, entertainment, and the service sector. But artificial intelligence, again, uses a smaller subset than cognitive computing to find hidden patterns. So cognitive computing, again, is to kind of help people find solutions where AI is really more about finding hidden patterns. So you may use AI to go find all the hacking information in all your log files, but then you're going to turn around and use cognitive computing to try to help your human find solutions to complex problems. Like, oh, who is this hacker? Why are they trying to get into my network? How far did they get in already? Right. So that's kind of how you would tie these two together and how cognitive computing can really help kind of extend 
um, the human's ability to help out and solve complex problems they just may not be really um, technologically trained to do or, or able to do. So that's essentially that it for that run over on how this chapter works, so kind of short, and I will see you in the next lecture.